So the PayPal story to LinkedIn is fun because in August of 2000, PayPal burned $12 million in one month and didn't really have a dime of revenue and the exp the cost curve was exponentiating. So Peter Max and I uh, did a uh, offsite for Labor Day weekend, I think it was. It was one of the weekends in September where we spent three days. First day was what's our strategy for how we change course for PayPal because we could chart the the mushroom cloud from the plowing into the side of the mountain. We, we could almost chart it by the hour when we would blow up. And we decided to be a master merchant. And fortunately for us and for the world, that turned out to be a good strategy and it worked because we had one. We, we used a lot of Star Wars metaphors, you know, the attack on the Death Star, you know, one shot in the trench because it was like we had one strategy we could play and other than that, we didn't have time. So what we would do, the business model for PayPal would be is that we would charge people for taking credit card payments. Uh, and that we would be essentially be their merchant of record, even though, so usually as a merchant, you establish your own relationship with the bank. By being a master merchant, we would have merchants who are not large enough to establish a relationship with the bank, but would actually have a direct relationship with PayPal, and PayPal would have the relationship with the bank. Uh, the second day, because we, uh, Max, Peter, and I were, well, this is, if this blows up, we're going to have the spectac one of the spectacular Silicon Valley failures on our hands, so we might as well do our next business together. So we, let's each of us talk, say, what is our best alternative idea? And uh, the early germinations of LinkedIn, right, some early components were one of the things I was working on because I had concluded from SocialNet that actually, in fact, your professional identity was really important. And Matt had had effect of what your economic opportunity was, that everyone should have a public professional uh, identity. It would help transform their, their work life, whether or not they're an employee or an entrepreneur or a lawyer, all these things that having an identity would be really important, and that this could be a driver for how you, you lived and worked your work life. Um, and so that was the idea I presented. And then PayPal worked out, and so I actually didn't go back and think about that idea until after we sold PayPal to eBay, I was like, well, what do I want to do next? Um, because I now have what I was calling my ransom, which was enough money I didn't need a salary, so I could go back to being a public intellectual and writing books or something if I wanted to do that. And I, I realized this, the pattern of a consumer internet company was something that was actually just beginning. It was super, like the Silicon Valley had gone kind of, kind of, the typical pattern for Silicon Valley is you all run to one technology trend, let's call it networking equipment or enterprise software or clean tech software. And you all do that and then you run to the next one. And so they'd all thought consumer internet was over. And I was like, no, no, it's just beginning and there is decades of interesting companies and work here. And I would like to participate in those. I would like to invest in them. I would like to create them. I think one could have a massive change of the world through these uh, companies. And so I invested in such companies as Friendster and Facebook and Flickr and a number of others, Zynga, uh, and then I uh, started LinkedIn. Uh, and that was because uh, this whole notion of how networks can be a platform for identity and for applications that help us navigate the world in a much better way, that was what I had started this whole thing, you know, my whole path in the Silicon Valley with. And that was, now is the, at least a time, if not the time, to really do that. I knew there was a very high probability I was right because um, I was close enough to it to know. Now, would I have known that you would have had these giant companies like, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Airbnb, you know, Dropbox? Uh, I wouldn't have necessarily known how big they were, but I knew the phenomena was real. And this is one of the areas where expertise really matters because I knew the cost of developing these services was going way down. There was open source software, there was cloud hosting, uh, that essentially much cheaper models for running these services. I also knew that the business models for the media and attention, just advertising alone would get better. And that the consumer demand for these products was there. So I couldn't have told you that, you know, some of these companies would be massive multi-billion dollar businesses, but I could have told you that the pro I know the products would work, I knew the business models would work. And so it was a worthwhile thing to, to engage in both as an entrepreneur, as an investor, and then personally, the way of transforming 
how you impact the world through software ecosystems that help people establish our identities, connect with each other, communicate with each other, coordinate with each other, seek entertainment, build social relationships. All of those things were the precise reason I got into Silicon Valley software creation, software entrepreneurship in the first place. So I was like, nope, this is the play. I had originally thought I was going to take a year off. And I said, no, I don't. I, I, I'll take two weeks. I'll go visit my friend Ned Hoyt in Australia. And then I'm back to the back to work because this is the time. And I was right about that. One of the metaphors I use for entrepreneurship is you jump off a cliff and you assemble an airplane on the way down. Now, if you do this in a particularly, to do this more intelligently, you're choosing your cliff, you're choosing when, you're preparing yourself with the right materials, the right teammates to jump over the cliff with, these sorts of things. But sometimes you just have a love of this technology or this area and you stumble your way into it. So it's not, you know, you can be more systematic, you can increase your probabilities, you can increase your scale of outcome. Uh, but also sometimes, you know, people are just like, uh, they happen to be doing something they love and all of a sudden the commercial models and venture and everything else goes into it and all of a sudden it's, it's off to the races. And there were a number of successful companies that started that way uh, in terms of that. So it's, it's both, but it's skill help, uh, skill and knowledge and networks help. When I left Stanford, my plan was to be a public intellectual. And what I mean by public intellectual is someone who, well, then what I meant was someone who writes essays and books uh, about kind of who are we as individuals and a society and who should we be? So it's kind of current, present, and direction. It's not necessarily uh, erudite. It doesn't mean you have to quote, you know, famous people and so forth. It's actually, in fact, but what is the collective human experience and what should we be doing? And my view of the path to that was by being an academic. And so uh, I was uh, fortunate to, to have received a Marshall Scholarship and so I thought that that would give me a chance to test whether or not being an academic was a good thing and that the specific kind of academic I might want to be would be a philosopher, um, in part because my interest is in thought and language. And so I went uh, to Oxford and, and uh, started becoming a student of philosophy. And then I quickly, fairly quickly realized that philosophical scholarship uh, wasn't interesting to me because it didn't have a broad enough impact. Uh, that I was principally kind of like, if I would say what was most driving me is to how to have an impact at scale by which you would uh, affect, help hopefully improve the lives of thousands to millions of people. Um, and that would require writing more popular works, popular works being frowned upon by the scholarly academy. Uh, and so I was like, okay, I have to do something else. I actually do think that one of the roles, counter what many professors believe, I think that one of the roles of the academy should be not ivory tower, but rather participation in society and participation in public intellectual discourse. Uh, I understand the drive to scholarship, the importance of scholarship, um, but I think it underplays these other important responsibilities. So it was difficult for, two, for that reason. It was also difficult because uh, it was like, okay, well, this public intellectual participation is what really matters to me. How do I still make that possible? How do I still contribute there? Uh, and it took me at least a year of serious thought to formulate a second plan. Um, and if I hadn't gone to Stanford, I never would have formulated the plan I have, which is software entrepreneurship. Um, and so it was like, oh, wait, maybe this would work. When I was thinking about public intellectuals and the kind of classic as an author of essays and books, I realized that that's, in some sense, an old school form of media, right? Which is to say, there's other forms of media, and that media is the, to some degree, the form that public intellectuals can operate in. And I said, well, actually software is transforming the world. And uh, there is all kinds of different ways that software affects how we think of ourselves, how we communicate, how we form an image of how the world works. 
and how we connect with each other. And so I was like, well, haven't ever really thought about being a business person. And by the way, even being an entrepreneur at that time, he said, you will be an entrepreneur. I was like, oh, I guess, <laughs> right? Like it was only years after I'd started, I was, I'd started LinkedIn, which is kind of the third startup that I was like, oh yes, entrepreneur is a word that describes me. Like I understand that that's a word that applies to me, but that wasn't like my goal was to be an entrepreneur. Um, what I realized is that actually creating software products could actually have this similar kind of public intellectual impact. And if it didn't have as much of an impact as I'd like, maybe I could make enough money that I could then not need to, to fund myself uh, through, I could um, essentially not need a salary, and so therefore I could become a public intellectual writing myself. And so it's kind of a plan A and a plan B. And, uh, and so I came back uh, from Oxford, first time since, uh, maybe since I was in junior high, I didn't have a structured strategic plan I, that I knew exactly what I was gonna do. It was like, I need to come figure out this software thing in Silicon Valley. And so I came back without any concrete plans. And um, at my second week of living at my dad's house, he's like, okay, so you're gonna go get a job now, right? And I'm like, well, I was gonna research a whole lot. He's like, why don't you research while you get a job? <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. And so I, um, uh, I was fortunate. This is one of the things where, I mean, I had some of the theory pieces of the fact that we live and work in a networked age now, um, and maybe I had some good instincts about that, but I just started calling my friends and saying, okay, where's, where's a good place to work? And one of my uh, close friends, um, uh, a gentleman named Stefan Heck, his roommate, Jesse Edlenbogen, uh, was working at Apple at the time. And he said, oh, well, what do you think about Apple? And I was like, oh, Apple's a great company. And so, uh, Stefan put Jesse and I in touch with each other, and my first job ended up being at Apple Computer. When I went to Jesse, he said, well, you don't have any, you don't have enough depth of engineering experience to en be an engineer, and you don't have enough, we're the UI group, the user experience group. Uh, uh, you don't have any specific, like, art experience, which is usually a requirement here. But however, we do have this kind of, like, set of problems that we have a headcount for that we don't know how to solve. Like, it's unclear who you'd hire to do that, and you seem smart. so." Uh, why don't you come on a contract and see what you can do, <laughs> right? I was like, oh, that's fine. That sounds interesting. Um, including the, okay, well, your output of your work has to be these design mock-ups. And so, so, you know, Photoshop is the tool we're using. And I'm like, well, I've never used Photoshop. I'm like, well, okay, here's a book. Uh, you should be ready to use it within a few days. And I'm like, okay, here we go. That was a, I love great learning curves. And that was a very interesting learning curve. Since I was on a contract, it was, I'd better move very quickly and work very hard. And, and, uh, and it was a great group. I was uh, managed by this woman, Cleo Huggins, who uh, uh, was a, uh, had a type design and RISD experience and was a great mentor very early in terms of thinking about design and user experience and whatnot. One of the things, the group I was working in was called the eWorld group. Most people think that meant, meant electronic world. Actually, it was employee world because it was it was originally funded for the replacement of an of a very innovative early program in Apple called Apple Link, and then they suddenly realized it was an online revolution, so they pivoted. But they pivoted essentially without a lot of strong backing from the company. The company really wanted a replacement from Apple Link. They weren't really had made a decision to engage in online services, and so it kind of taught me that if you didn't have the right coherent strategy that at least you knew what you were going to, even if you were pivoting and changing, you had to buy into that. It would lead to a lot of artifacts that um, would cause the project to fail. And this is actually one of the things that causes a lot of big company projects to fail because if they don't have a essentially enough of a mandate to both have the initial strategic target and the changes and pivots that need to happen along with it, uh, usually those projects fail. Uh, pretty badly. And eWorld uh, was basically a failure, although because another mentor of mine there, James Isaacs, had during the negotiations said, okay, well, let's, we're, they were, they licensed the America Online platform. They said, look, let's throw in this term that we're not, we aren't really interested in because we'll allow it to be negotiated out because one of the negotiation tactics is to throw in a set of terms so you can, you can remove them in order to get other things that you want. So they asked for 5% warrants in America Online. And as it turned out, that, that, uh, that condition stuck. And the warrants in America Online had become so valuable that, that that was more valuable than the entire 
cost of the eWorld project. So at the end of the day, even though Apple shut it down, they actually made money on the whole project. I wasn't there during Jobs. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that both Jobs and the team he assembled uh, was very good at envisioning new specific artifacts. And one of the things that people, I think, under-realize about Jobs is they tend to have this, we tend to have this model of creative genius, like he sits in a room and he goes, Eureka. Actually, Jobs spent a lot of time connecting with interesting folks in Silicon Valley. And so, for example, with the Macintosh, it was going to Xerox Park. Right? There's a whole set of things. And curating to what could actually happen now, given what that was, that was part of, the, part of where they, a central part of where the genius came from. And, uh, you know, Apple is obviously one of the iconic transformative companies of our century. When I was at Oxford and I realized that software might be an interesting medium for pursuing public intellectual, I knew that what I was interested in software was essentially um, how we kind of understand ourselves and our identity, how we understood other people, how we understood our relationship, uh, how we shaped the world, how we communicated with people, how we collaborated with people. And I had exposure to the internet from Stanford uh, because I'd interned at the Center for Study of Language and Information. Um, I'd done the computational course with symbolic systems. Now, it was just before the commercialization of the internet. And so when I came out, I originally was thinking I was gonna design, this is an old school term, uh, personal information managers. I was gonna work on those sorts of products the way of doing this. And within about a month of being here, I had realized that America Online was growing, CompuServe was beginning to be paid attention to, Prodigy, as most young people today would be, I'd have no idea what I'm talking about with everything other than maybe America Online. And I realized the online revolution was the area that I would want to participate. And in particular was because uh, when you thought about my interest, the network era of we are all in a network together and what becomes possible was precisely the kind of thing that I wanted to help shape. And I had a whole stack of ideas on it. Um, and part of it was I was young and novice and inexperienced as a business person or as an entrepreneur. And so how do you form a business? Like what product ideas, that was relatively straightforward, although there was still a lot of learning there. But how do you start a company? How do you get financing? How do you have a business model? Now the fortunate thing about early consumer internet is that everyone was fairly novice in this because there were different business rules, there were different ways you did customer acquisition, there were different technologies at play. Um, and so anyway, I, I, um, I had realized that the way the capital markets work is they're either kind of open for a specific sector, in which case, as a first time entrepreneur, you can get financing, or they're closed, in which case it's very difficult unless you're, you have some very deep seasoned experience. And so I, uh, went worked through my job at Apple very quickly. I worked through my job at Fujitsu very quickly because I realized that I didn't know how long the capital markets would stay open and I needed to go and try to start a company and get some new product ideas out. And so uh, I quit my job at Fujitsu in July of 97 and my first company, SocialNet, uh, was financed in November of 1997. It was called SocialNet. Actually, it was called Relationships.com at the time, and I later renamed it to SocialNet when I realized I wanted something that was more broad than just a dating service in terms of concept. Well, SocialNet was, uh, in Silicon Valley parlance, a failure. Uh, we did return our capital to our investors, but we didn't actually make an ongoing company. Um, one of the great things about Silicon Valley is that uh, failure is actually not penalized, because it's a question of what did you learn and what can you do now? And so uh, this enables people to be bold about startups. This enables people to be to take risks and to try things. And I knew that going into it. And so I knew that there was, you know, that I had, you know, there's a long shot on your first company being successful. I knew I had a long shot, but I wanted to try. And I knew that I would, if I didn't succeed, I would try again. Um, now, the exact path I ended up doing was was not planned when I started SocialNet because it's like, well, I'll try SocialNet. If it doesn't work, I'll try another one. As it turned out, um, in my early days in SocialNet, uh, a good friend of mine from Stanford, Peter Thiel, had moved back uh, from New York. 
I had started a small fund, was investing in companies, and then had decided to co-found a company uh, at that point called Fieldlink, then Confinity, and then PayPal with someone he had met, Max Levchin, and they had asked me to be on the board uh, when uh, they were they were essentially founding the co- when Peter was stepping off as an investor and co-founding the company, the new iteration of the company with Max. And we had one of Max's friends on the board, a guy named Scott Bannister, who's a good guy and a friend of mine today, Max, Peter, and myself. Uh, and it was actually through uh, social net was essentially a failure, all kinds of learning experiences, all like literally I could go on for hours about the things I learned to do differently uh, from social net. But because I had been recounting all those lessons to Peter, Peter said, well, come join the board of PayPal, help us with that. And then about a year after that, Peter's like, well, look, could you come help us grow this like full time? And uh, I had already learned a whole bunch of new things. And I was like, okay, I would be able to implement them at PayPal. So I joined him uh, in January of 2000 uh, as a, as a, I think my first title at PayPal was COO. I never really care about titles. It was more like what the work is. One thing is you have to think about whether or not, uh, where do you need flexibility and rigidity in terms of what the team you're assembling is? In some things, like for example, you're going to build a new phone. You need to have exact rigidity. You need to know exactly what you're doing. You know, need to have that skill set. In some things, you want flexibility. Like in a new area, we're trying to figure out software, especially, is it tends to be flexible. So, what I had done because I had imagined this is the way you start a company is I had drawn on an org chart and said, hey, "We need people with you know five to ten years of experience doing this, this, and this." And by the way, you need some of that in engineering and whatnot. But what I learned to do, what we did at PayPal was to hire generalists, to hire people who learn fast, to hire people who are flexible, because you, you, you are highly likely to pivot in what you're doing. So that was one lesson. Another one was all companies, software companies, other companies, need to have a customer acquisition model fundamentally in, in their strategy. They can't just think, oh, I'll build a really good product and we'll figure out the customer acquisition later. And the consumer internet patterns of customer acquisition are broadly different than they are. So if like, for example, virality or search engine optimization, or no, they're not just like, oh, buy some advertising. Uh, and so we didn't understand that because we, we never formed a business before. We never had had the experience within, uh, within, um, uh, within starting a company and, and a consumer internet company. And so uh, that was another thing. So for example, PayPal um, uh, was, had virality fundamentally at its core. Uh, because these were part of the walks that Peter and Max and I would take and say, look, this is you have to build this in from the ground level up in order to be successful. And then, but you know, these are just two examples of tons. And one of the things, for example, uh, I realized, in, like financing is another thing most entrepreneurs, first-time entrepreneurs, don't understand how you pick your venture partners, how you do a financing deck. And so, for example, one of the things I realized I could do, kind of post the success of LinkedIn. Uh, was I published our Series B deck and kind of what the analysis was of how creating a financing deck and how to do that and and how to select venture partners and so forth because uh, these these decks are very rarely published because by the way they're frequently <laughs> the mature business is very different than the business that's discussed but as and the the founders don't have an interest in it but since I was trying to help entrepreneurs it was like okay this is something I could publish and help people so there's just just a long list of lessons. This is one of the things Peter and I would talk about. The first book I would ever thought I would write would be a book on friendship, because I think there's a bunch of interesting things that are about friendship. And in fact, um, the uh, you know the way that we go through life together is essentially the thing that most occupies my attention. Whether it's the way we go through life as friends, whether it's as colleagues, whether it's as, you know, citizens, uh, whether it's as workers. And to some degree, I think all of the theories of meaning of life that I think have some substance is how are we going through life together? What are our obligations to each other? What are our obligations to ourselves? What are the things we can aspire to? How do we make ourselves when we aspire to what is the best in humanity? How do we get there, and the way that we discover that is through conversation with each other, through, this is part of the public intellectual, through 
um, uh, through hearing other people's points of view and evolving our own and evolving theirs. And so that network connectivity, that, that how people, how we shape each other is, is at the bedrock of what I pay attention to and work in. So the, the kind of the foundation of LinkedIn is the insight that every individual, whether a student or Bill Gates, having a public professional identity that helps you navigate your world of work, what you're particularly seeking to do, is extremely helpful. And it's helpful both on an inbound basis because one of the truths about living and working in the networked age is that you have to have a strategy for how you're found and then how the right signal gets through to you and being found because there are millions of people out there. So you have to think each CPU processor, each agent, each person. How do you get found by the right person, the right people, and how do you do business with them? And then also, how do you find the right people? How do you find expertise? How do you find business opportunities? How do you find jobs? How do you find how to invest in yourself? And both of those are through the network as a, as a fabric, as a foundation. And so um, I realized my time at SocialNet, talking to Peter and Max at PayPal, that this would be that one of the fundamental ways to transform people's lives is to enrich their economic opportunity, to enrich their ability to either work, to start companies, to navigate whatever economic life is important to them, and that that would be a, uh, a worthy goal of, you know, 12 plus years of my life and still going. Even today, most people coming to LinkedIn don't really realize how strong the tools are. Because most people, when they think I look for work, they go, we have job listings on LinkedIn. They go and look at the job listings. It's a perfectly valid thing to do. But the really interesting thing is to say, well, who do you know who is, in our language of LinkedIn, two degrees away from you, who can help give you guidance, who can say, well, this company is a good place to work, or there's this opportunity here. I mean, it goes all the way back to my work, my business career started with a call to a Stanford friend whose roommate was working at Apple. How do you discover those opportunities? Well, that all comes from your network. And so even today, with you know, well over 300 million people on LinkedIn, people still have, most people have yet to learn how to use their network in order to, to ally with their network in order to find the right economic opportunities. And that's some of the things that we're, I'm still working on, we're still working on. Anyway, it's the long ways to go still. So having had the experience of both SocialNet and PayPal, LinkedIn is one of the unusual consumer internet plays that m there were a lot of details and a lot of new learnings, but the broad scope of what we were doing, the broad scope of what the business model would be, the broad scope of what features would be in the future, we had many of these ideas at the beginning. And, uh, and the, for example, apply with LinkedIn, that your LinkedIn profile would become your public identity, would become the thing that you would by which people would find you for hiring you, for doing business with you, for doing business with your company, for you applying for a job. That that we knew from the very beginning. And one of the powerful things, so frequently people think, oh, there's business and there's changing the world. And that they frequently think of them as different. Like they think of changing the world as a government thing or a nonprofit thing. Um, and of course, there's some purity to the nonprofit and government and what you're doing and being of service. But Commercial models are very powerful because commercial models mean that there's a lot of money for reinvesting and building out the product. And so if you create a business that also has great social impact, has great empowerment of people, both as individuals and as groups, uh, and the business model works, your ability to reinvest in that business and create a much stronger service, platform, utility, tool, is great, and that's one of the things that I've uh, loved about moving from being a, you know, a student into being a business person. Even still having the goal of contributing uh, uh, as a public intellectual. We get a lot of criticism of being boring um, over the years, and there is both some fairness and some non-fairness to that criticism. The fairness is that I'm sure we could, we, year by year, we endeavor to make the service better, inter more interesting, easier to use. 
the unfairness is actually, in fact, our goal isn't entertainment. Our goal is helping put the tools of navigating the networked world of work into people's hands. And people don't do that to watch like a, you know, cute cat pictures or, you know, funniest home pet videos or whatnot. That, like entertainment is not our goal. Transforming people's ability to lead their economic lives is our goal. And frequently, by the way, that's that requires some work and is not simply entertaining and whatnot. And so uh, I would say that I, broadly speaking, uh, I pay attention to that feedback as a way to help me improve making the service better, but I don't lose track of the fact that my primary goal is how do I enable people's economic lives. And we actually knew we were rolling out some sales products. We knew that would be there. Uh, we knew that there would be um, uh, business productivity products. So like we have this whole kind of how do businesses advertise to professionals. We knew all, there's nuances of, of how, which products do you do first? What's the first version of them? But we knew that that would be a, uh, those would be f first early important parts of the business model. Actually, there was one part that was a little different. Um, we thought that we would start by selling to individuals for years and that we'd only get to corporations later. We actually built our corporate product for recruiters much earlier than we anticipated. And the reason was because uh, we started getting phone calls saying, we'd like to buy your enterprise product, please. And we're like, well, we don't have one. They're like, well, but that's what I want to buy. And we're like, oh, uh, okay, we'll call you back in three months. We're going to go build one. <laughs> So that the the speed at which that happened was was uh, was was well earlier than planned. This goes back to an entrepreneurship. You figure out how much of it is is flexibility and how much of it's rigidity in terms of your plan. Software tends to be flexibility. Flo software tends to be adaptability. So part of the key lesson in skill set is to actually be able to recognize uh, uh, where the business might actually need to move to, and then change the business to get there. To give you a PayPal example, in the first week after PayPal launched, there were all these eBay people on PayPal. And the internal discussion at PayPal was, well, this isn't our use case. We're supposed to be splitting dinner checks and person-to-person -person payments. Maybe we should get these people off the site. And then suddenly the company went, no, no, these are our customers, <laughs> right? This is what our business is. And in software, that recognition is very important. you had an interest in philosophy as a young man. Hmm. So um, one of the very good pieces of advice that my freshman advisor at Stanford gave me in order to figure out a major was to read through courses and degrees and circle the courses that I had to take before I left and then figure out what the coherent pattern was. And what I realized, my central interest was how we, as people, as humans, think, speak, reason, communicate, understand each other. And so uh, at Stanford, that led me to the major that was called Symbolic Systems, which is this kind of medley of computer science, philosophy, linguistics, psychology, some mathematical logic. That's pretty much the set of it. And while I was doing that, I realized that we didn't have very good models for what it was to think, what it was to speak, what it was to understand each other. And so I got uh, more interested in philosophy as a possibility for understanding how we, how we kind of form images of the world, how we, it is possibly we can communicate. And that's where the specific kind of scholarly interest in philosophy came from. Now, that all being said, uh, when I left Stanford, my primary thought was I was going to become an academic. And the class that I most wanted to teach was a meaning of life class. And you could call that philosophy as well, although that's not what professional academic philosophers would think of as philosophy. Uh, but I also have that kind of broad interest in kind of what is the human experience, what is the meaning of human life. There's um, uh, contemporary, what is called analytic philosophy, which is generally speaking uh, uh, the US and the UK and some of the Commonwealth, uh, theorizes philosophy as kind of pre-science. When you have areas that have not yet gotten to the discipline of a rigorous methodology, you know, possibly experimental science, 
although not all in all science necessarily, of course, experimental, uh, that it's the realm of philosophy. And it's kind of that uh, what philosophy most primarily does is give birth to sciences. And so what they, their methodology is primarily to kind of begin to do all this pre-theoretic work. Now, there is some folks who study the history of philosophy as well, but that's a subset, small discipline of that. Now, the analytic philosophers view themselves as in contrast to the continental philosophers, who are, uh, generally speaking, Europe, although there's also, of course, international traditions of various sorts, which uh, view themselves to actually be more the framers of kind of what is, how are we embedded in language? How are we embedded in society? How are we embedded in like uh, kind of a, an intellectual tradition of like, you know, kind of like what is being in the world or, you know, what is nothingness and these sorts of things. And uh, analytic philosophers and continental philosophers both each tend to think that the other tradition is foolish. Uh, so there's a lot of intellectual battles between those two, two traditions. I myself don't ascribe to either of them. Um, although I find things to learn in each of them. Both my parents are lawyers, um, and have both had professional law careers. Uh, my father had something of political activism uh, in him. His first, um, um, you know, kind of, he was working in a legal clinic in Berkeley as his first job after Stanford Law School. Uh, and uh, among his accomplishments, uh, uh, as part of the pro bono work he was doing uh, when he was here at the law firm in San Francisco, uh, he helped make sure that a film called Death in the West was uh, declared as a public interest film. Basically what this film had done is it had gone and interviewed six, um, you know, it was very um, popular for cigarette companies to have cowboys as the instance of manliness, you know, saying, oh, I smoke, you know, various cigarette companies. And um, so they interviewed them and then they went back, I think it was 10 years later, and they um, uh, tried to do the six follow-up interviews. Uh, I believe three of them were at the gravestones where the folks had died from lung cancer. Two of them were in the hospital when they're on respirators and one of them was seriously ill. So of course, this made the, the, the smoking is dangerous case rather compellingly and the, uh, the cigarette industry sued uh, to destroy the film because uh, the, it, it was so expensive. They folded, they gave all copies, but a, a, a um, copy was um, escaped and was in the wild. And my dad's legal work was to get this declared as a public interest law, which therefore meant copyright didn't apply, which meant that the, the cigarette companies could not stop it from being played. And this is the sort of thing that my father would do as, 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 a, as a political figure. He wasn't really... Um, uh, neither here nor my mother are really intellectuals in the way that, uh, well, I mean them or, or differently the way society means them. My definition of intellectual is somewhat different, but very politically active. Uh, both my parents' family is essentially heavily immigrant. Um, but on my father's side, uh, my father's grandfather um, was an L.A. newspaperman and was the author of, a, I think, his most popular work, a lot of Westerns, was a Gunslinger Gospel. And um, there was an early black and white uh, film made of it. And uh, my father's mother uh, is a descendant of the Wiley family, which is, uh, I believe, the founders of the Indiana University at Bloomington and were pastors. Um, I don't have an exact, uh, I'm, I'm classically American, you kind of, as you get past great grandparents, it gets very blurry. I was born in the Stanford Hospital because my uh, father was a law student at Stanford at the time. Uh, actually, it entertained my father to no end that um, for many years, my Stanford transcript had birthplace unknown on it, which was which he thought was super entertaining given it was like, well, it was here. Um, but uh, an education was stressed, although one of the things that was a funny early conflict was um, my family was a, is a very strong believer in public education. And my father, my mother, uh, my father's parents uh, all went to Cal, you know, University of California, Berkeley, public education. And so when I announced that my intention to go to Stanford rather than Cal, there was a substantive family discussion about the 
virtues and values of, of, of public education, um, which I eventually pre prevailed mostly because my father was willing to pay the tuition bill to send me to Stanford. I persuaded, I think I got my father onto private school because I had grown convinced when I was young. I went to a public junior high school, uh, Martin Luther King School in, um, uh, in Berkeley, and uh, probably is indirectly related to my paying a lot of attention to Martin Luther King and thinking he's one of the great American heroes. And, uh, um, and what happened is I had grown convinced that I would thrive uh, much better in smaller classroom environments. And so I waged a year-long campaign with my father to send me to a private high school. The first one was the College Preparatory School, uh, which is on the Berkeley-Oakland border, and then later the Putney School, which is in Vermont. And what I would do is I would look at the um, local newspapers every day, and every time there was an article about gang violence at Berkeley High, drugs, <laughs> you know, anything else, I would clip them out and leave them for my father so as to persuade him that I, this wasn't just a frivolous exercise, although all I was really trying to do is persuade him to send me to a school with smaller classrooms. I've never really thought of this before. It might be a good presage for an entrepreneurial career. Uh, for me, it was that I'd gotten, um, I got the independence bug a little early. I wanted to establish my own identity. I wanted to kind of live, you know, kind of with my own, like if I could have rented my own apartment, I probably would have. Um, and, uh, and I also wanted to get a little bit more of a broader experience of the world. And that's, you know, I certainly wouldn't have gone to Stanford as an undergraduate if I hadn't already gone to Berkeley. Because if I, if, if, I'm sorry, Ver, uh, Putney School, because having gone to the Putney School, I basically was like, now it's time to reacquaint myself with San Francisco and my family and everything else. And so coming back to Stanford actually made sense as one of the options. Whereas uh, otherwise, there would have been zero chance I would have considered anything in the Bay Area. Part of my selection of Putney as a place to apply to and go was the fact that the experience set was broad. And one of the things that I had picked up from both of my parents was an interest in diversity of experience. Now, maple syrup farming was one of the things that I had some experience doing. Blacksmithing is another one, um, you know, and then there's, you know, more like cross country skiing and artwork and a bunch of other things. But uh, the Putney School prides itself on differentiation, uh, on on not just academic, but, a, but kind of a rounded people. Uh, and so, for example, everyone who goes through Putney has some experience with art, uh, just that you get you know, some breadth in that, some experience with the outdoors. Uh, it breaks into um, camping trips uh, two or three times a year where everyone goes out and, you know, climbs a mountain, canoes, bicycle trips, like this whole thing in order to get all of the experience. And that was, uh, that was part of the reason I chose to go there. You don't get credit for them, but uh, every quarter you have a work chore. And the work chore can range from uh, serving wait staff in the kitchen or cl clean up to maple syrup farming to the one that always was granted to the new students because it was the least desirable was winter barn which is you get up at 5 a.m in a in the vermont cold and dark and you truck across to the barn and you shovel cow manure uh, for about an hour and a half and it's uh, definitely what one calls a character building experience through high school I read a lot of science fiction. So Frank Herbert and Dune and Orson Scott Card and Ender's Game. And it's kind of the imagination of what are the, what are the, what, what might humanity evolve to? Uh, what it defined to be humanity? Because the great science fiction is awesome. There's a lot of not so good science fiction as well. And then once I got to Stanford and a, another important reason I selected Stanford is they have a program called Structured Liberal Education, which is this kind of two-thirds of your freshman year is spent studying a combination of philosophy, history, art. Um, and in the movement, the, back when I was there, it was called Western Civilization, although Structured Liberal Education already hit the world civilization. Like So you would read Chinese philosophers and a number of others. 
And at that point, I started realizing that people were writing essays about what the meaning of life is, what, uh, how it is that we should live a good life. Uh, and at that point, you know, there's a, there's a set of the classics. There's, you know, everything from Greek philosophers to Chinese philosophers. But perhaps the most, the book that most people wouldn't have heard of that had a fairly big impact on me when I was a freshman um, was a media critic named Neil Postman who wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death, uh, Public Discourse in the Age of Television. And I began to realize that the structural means of communication, the structural means of the, the Marshall McLuhan, kind of the median is the message, actually shaped our identity, shaped how we perceived the world, how we perceived each other, and how we came to judgments about what is truth. And uh, that's where I started getting interested in how kind of thought and language uh, were important, how um, the way that we communicate and the medium by which we communicated, we uh, crafted messages was uh, extremely important to a better life. I wrote the first book, Startup of You, which was based off the commencement speech I gave to my high school, the Putney School, which is be the entrepreneur of your own life. Because what I realized when I was talking to students, because commencement speeches are this, is what should you know? It's like, actually, in fact, the model is no longer career ladder or escalator. It's being the entrepreneur of your own life. And those are the skills you need for now, this generation. So then I was like, well, so now people need to understand how to hire and manage the startup of you workforce. Um, but they have no clue. So what should I do? Well, maybe I should write an essay, and I'll send that essay to HBR and, and publish on kind of how to think about managing an adaptive and, ad uh, and people who are being the entrepreneurs of their own career workforce. And they said, well, we'll publish the essay, but we really want to publish the book. And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. Actually, I could see how a book could be useful here. So we then, we then published a book. And the, the primary thought in the book was that it is now truth in, in gr and growing more and more true in all industries, all countries, all regions, that people work at multiple companies through their career. And yet that conversation does not happen honestly in almost any business today, even in Silicon Valley, which understands this. Like, like it doesn't start with, hey, we should talk about like, what's your next tour here? Is it gonna be somewhere else? We should have this as an open and honest conversation because we should mutually plan for it and we should mutually help each other. Because even though lifetime employment at one company may be much rarer now, a lifetime relationship is still totally possible and is still mutually beneficial. And what's more, the only way you can invest in the future is if you have honest conversations with each other, if you have basis of trust. And so it's like, okay, here's a set of tools for doing that. And uh, uh, and I've been pleased, actually. One of the things that's been very nice about the publication of the Alliance has been, like, literally talking to people where they're like, I read it yesterday and I put it in motion today. And that's, you know, it's very pleasing as an author. It's been great because uh, we decided to write a very practical book about what is, uh, uh, how do you essentially relate with adaptable talent? Because you'll need them because that's the only way your company is going to adapt. And the youth, the millennials, have learned that adaptability is what it's about anyway. So how do you create that in a good way, in a way that benefits both you as an employer, as a manager, as a company, and also uh, the talent, the, the, your employees? And how do you form a good basis of trust in an adaptable world? And that's essentially the, we, we have a whole bunch of different uh, very specific tactics to help people with and, um, you know, means for building a good alliance. And uh, it's been delightful that most people read it and when they go, yes, this is something I want to implement, they literally start the next day. Matter of fact, someone here at this event told me he read the book and bought it for, his, for every manager in his company. I still think we have a long way to go on networks and marketplaces. So whether they're payments networks, social networks, uh, made some investments in Bitcoin as a really out there kind of uh, currency network. Uh, and it may, Bitcoin may be huge. Um, the, uh, and also marketplaces like Airbnb and others, uh, the sharing economy. 
terms of sharing resources, what that means for transport with companies like Uber and Lyft. Now, there's still a ton more to come there. There's some very interesting things, I think, coming in the intersection of, of networks and biology and computation, whether it's personalized medicine, uh, targeting health by genetics, uh, being able to actually even modify genetics. So if you had a genetic condition that was predisposition to extreme ill health, you might actually, there's this technology called CRISPR that might be able to, to both understand it and also change it. Um, there is, I think, a lot of transformation of education uh, coming through networks. You know, you've got everything from the Khan Academy uh, to, you know, one of my investments, Edmodo, is a social network for K-12. That's what I mean, there's more social networks. And so uh, I think there's a, uh, I think, you know, it, to use a baseball metaphor, it may very well be that we're in inning one still. What happened is uh, I, had, I had led the first round in Friendster because most people who wanted to do networks wanted to come talk to me, and I did LinkedIn. And then I had all this press that was like, well, is this having your cake and eating it too? And aren't these competitive? I'm like, no, they're not competitive. But one of the key things about integrity is to not just uh, uh, have integrity, but also appear to have integrity. It's impo important both to have the substance and the appearance. And so, uh, so appearance matters to, to being able to, to, le to show and live with how much integrity matters. And so when Sean called me and said, well, you know, there's this thing called the Facebook. I think it was called the Facebook at the time versus Facebook. And I was like, I know about it. It's awesome. I'd love to invest. But, you know, probably I shouldn't lead because of this thing, but Peter would be excellent. Uh, and so Peter should lead, and I will participate. Um, and so, uh, and then I also brought in Mark Pincus because uh, Mark and I had this uh, patent that we shared called the Six Degrees patent. And I thought it was just fair that since we were doing that, he should also be an investor here. And I think Sean had also talked to him. And... Um, uh, and so we all were in the first money, and Peter led and joined the board, and, and obviously it was a massively successful investment um, for Peter and for me. I mean, even with my, even with following him, but it was probably the economic, the most, on a pure economic basis, was probably the most expensive decision uh, I have made. But integrity is worth it. Part of what's great about software entrepreneurship, especially with networks and marketplaces, is that for a relatively small amount of money, you can create massive scale impact. So ultimately, LinkedIn could have gotten everywhere it was gotten with about $13 million in cash. That's affecting well over 300 million people growing in tens of millions, right? I don't know what the company, I don't know what our public statement is about growth. Uh, so I'm being oblique because <laughs> uh, public company rules. Uh, and helping transform what their economic opportunities are, how jobs are found, how businesses are built, how clients are found. Uh, and all of that has a huge impact on how they can fund education for their kids and all the rest of the stuff. So the impact is huge. So with an idea, that, you know, it's, uh, luck, hard work, drive, knowledge, expertise, networks, all of that, you can achieve huge scale and that kind of that, that optimism and belief that we have in the American dream and entrepreneurship is all very much alive and present. And it's, uh, it's great.